It's a great pleasure for me to receive today Professor Brandon Dixon. He's a professor in the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech. He told me most of his research was focused on the lymphatic system. And this is what we are going to share together, his idea, his approach, and his last 20 years of research. Yeah. That's great. Great to be here with you. Do you want to talk to us about coagulation in the lymph system? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, we, we were talking about this before the call. It's not anything I've necessarily done. I, I will say several years ago, we were really interested in lymph viscosity. Um, you know, uh, we, we were wondering how lymph viscosity might change in disease or even like in your gut, right? When you drink, when you eat lipid, most fat gets absorbed through your intestinal lymphatics. And so we were, we started collecting lymph, um, we worked with this uh, Patrick So, and we were collecting really small amounts of lymph, and then we would measure the viscosity of the lymph. And when we did that, we found that it clotted, <laughs> particularly after a meal. You could have these precipitates actually fall out of solution when we were trying to measure viscosity. There's no, there was no blood in it, but proteins would it would form these things that clotted. So we ended up adding heparin to the lymph after we collected it, and then we could measure viscosity. So that was sort of the anecdotal. But it doesn't stop the flow. You make the you make everything more viscous. No, it didn't. It didn't stop the flow. We were collecting lymph. It's just when we got it out, we noticed it would clot. Like just the way, like when you collect blood, you have to have heparin coated tubes or it clots. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. that's what we we found. So we don't um, know if it, if it clog in, in well, vivo. It does. Yeah. So I, I, I'm getting to that. I we have not done that, but Melody Swartz has shown some recent data that shows that in certain conditions lymph clots can form in vivo in inflammatory conditions. So it, it could be, you know, it could be a protective me mechanism to like help prevent viral dissemination. If you know there's a particular region that you detect a pathogen, maybe the lymph can clot to sort of locally stop lymph flow. It may have other... A, a poison if you get the yeah. scorpio bite or something. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a definitely an active area of, of research. And then and then you know that begs the question, well, do you have abnormal lymphatic clotting and is that driving other presentations of you know yeah. lymphatic disease? And and I it's I think it's an interesting question. It's relatively unexplored. How often do you see a retrograde pumping? It's so common, it's constant in the lymphatic uh, how, oh, let's see, let's let me define that. So are we gonna call retrograde pumping being the contractions go backwards or the fluid goes backwards both and and the other yeah. question is if it's one lymph function, it doesn't matter if you know yeah. if it's a whole yeah, no, i mean we're talking about chains so yeah so i mean in normal lymphatic function there is retrograde flow every single time the vessel opens up but it's usually really short because yeah. the valve works yeah. Yeah. and the valve but the valve does not close until the lymphatic flow starts going backwards like they're there, Mike Davis has shown this. Valves are favored to be open, right? Um, yeah, yeah, because you don't want to be you don't want to be constantly you don't be like intentionally blocking forward flow. So you want them to be open, and really only want them to shut whenever there starts to be a lot of backflow. Right. So there's all. So that means that flow, flow and lymph is all. And I, Jimmy probably showed. So I think he showed some videos. It's always going back and forth, and back and right. forth. But, but that's on the flow side. Would you see something going yeah. really retrograde? Not, not. You shouldn't in normal conditions because the link scale of these things. We actually measured this in a in a rat tail. It was quite tedious. A rat tail is about this long. There are roughly thirty six valves in that length, so you're not going to see retrograde over a long distance. You would have to have thirty six valves not working, <laughs> right? Um, it, it, they they shut rather quickly. Um, so you don't, and at least in normal healthy. Now I don't know, you know. In a lymphatic vessel that's lost all valves, maybe it's super dilated, has no, maybe you can actually, you know, you really do see that. As um, well assume after many, many years yeah. of month, yeah. that the, the valve are not, are not functioning anymore properly. Sure. And people, uh, retrograde. Yeah. And maybe, maybe one benefit of compression, uh, in addition to, of course, just keeping the limb from getting bigger, but one of the benefit of compression could be actually to keep the lymphatic vessel from beginning big getting bigger so the valves can still close, right? You think like if you have valve leads, if the vessel gets really large, the valves aren't able to close anymore. But maybe if you can add pressure to the vessel to actually... So I know you have some slides for us. Yeah. I'm going to talk a little bit about some work we've done. I think one slide with a company, Lymphatech. And so this is my conflict of interest disclosure. I like to start with this slide here. We call ourselves the Laboratory of Lymphatic Biology and Bioengineering. We develop technologies 
all of those technologies we develop with the view towards using them to ask questions of basic lymphatic biology or develop a diagnostics to detect lymphatic dysfunction or the nature of that dysfunction and then therapies to treat it. One of the biggest hurdles that we really needed to come was how we track and measure lymphedema. And basically, it's a 3D scanner that creates a full 3D model of the limb and then can really accurately calculate limb volume. That's on the market now. Yeah, this is on the market now. Lymphatech is the clinical tool for tracking lymphedema volume. And it, it does like arms and legs, uh, trunk lymphedema. They're working on head and neck, but that's not commercially available. That's still in research and development stage. Do you know um, it costs more yeah. or less, uh, the, the scanner? I think the scanner is around $900 or something like that. It would be more for clinic. Yeah, there's a license per device. So the, the license allows it. You can be shared. It can go to any exam room or things like that. So and I mean, we... Complete the scan is less than one minute. Yes. And then all the all the analysis and software is, is automa automated. Before and before, after, uh, perfect. Yeah. The black lines here are a vessel contracting that we've taken out. The blue line is a flow in the vessel. So what we're doing is we're like pushing flow through the center of the vessel and we're, we're gradually increasing it. If flow in the vessel goes up, its contraction goes down. You can kind of see that. Right. Uh, and we call this like shear inhibition. And that's yeah. internal, rece that internal stretch receptors or internal receptors. Yeah. So these can be stretch independent because you can keep the pressure on the vessel constant and only change the fluid shear and still see this. So they're endothelial cell receptors that, you know, they could be integrins on the surface that bend or proteins at the junctions. Then, and furthermore, we can do something like this. So if, if uh, just, I'll just focus you on these first two rows. So this is the diameter of the vessel. So you see it's just kind of contracting. And then here, the frequency changes. What you're looking at here is the difference in pressure. So you could think about flow through the vessel. So here, the pressure on either side is, is constant. So we're not pushing anything through the vessel. Then what we do is we turn on flow and turn it off. So we, it's, it, what we're trying to do is, is simulate the rhythm. What, yeah. what a lymphangion next to it would do. Or a massage. Like it could be, you know. But And what you find is the vessel will actually contract with the flow. So... As the flow gets pushed into the vessel, the vessel dilates. And then when the flow slows down, the vessel contracts again. And you know what would be amazing is you tr to try different flow rhythm, different hertz, and yes. try optimum flow for massages for the lymphatic. Yes, you, you, uh, you, uh, we should talk more after this. So first we did it on the vessel. Like, so these are frequencies. Yeah. And we looked at like, could I make the vessel pa pump faster? Could I make it pump slower? The long story short is there's an optimal range. Like if you try to do it too fast, the vessel cannot relax and contract that fast. Like it has a maximum frequency. Right, if you try right. to do it faster, it can't. If you try to do it too slow, the vessel's own like intrinsic pumping takes over. Because when you really, really slow down, well, the vessel just starts pumping. So there's like this window that it works frequency wise. So then what we did, because this is all just a vessel that we've taken out. 0 0.1, 0 0.15. Yeah. And optimum. And this is what we use. We use a 0 0.1 hertz with our hands. Yeah. So this here is, that's going to be great. I'll show you the next slide because we do Amazing. this. Amazing. This is your maximum, it's, 0 0.1 hertz. Yeah. This is, what this is, is actually a difference in frequency. So this is, we measure the frequency of the vessel on its own. And this is the difference in the frequency you apply to what it's doing on its own. And so that if you're too fast or too slow, then it doesn't work. What you said is this is, is the next slide. So we, we developed a little cuff that would massage the rat tail, but in a controlled way. Right. So it has a bunch of little cuffs that inflate and we control the timing of when they flayed and how fast. And so we could test all these questions like how fast should I massage as I move along? How fast at any given one location should I massage? All those sorts of things. So as you predicted, massage has an effect. So here's what, what you're looking at here. This is an example of the contraction measured with imaging with ICG, not ICG, but NIR, a, a different molecule, but the same idea. So here, all these spikes, those are contractions. Here, we turn on the massage at one location. And we, we this is just at a single location, massaging on, off, on, off, on. Off. And what you notice is the vessel contracts with the massage. Actually, these intensity changes are not due to us squeezing. Like it's not directly like us squeezing the lymph in and out. It is the actual vessel contracting in right. response to the massage. And that's just a zoom in so you can see because this is over a period. Like each of those is a is a massage, and you see right after you start squeezing, the vessel contracts and then dilates.
post OPW, then we yes. density. Why is that? So in this case here, we're keeping pressure constant. And so, um, oh yeah, this, so this is, uh, this is, we stop the massage and immediately after we stop the massage, there's not a lot of contraction. Um, the other, although part of the issue is that we've drained a lot of the fluid because you've injected a tracer and the lymphatics are working right, quite right, well and the right. entire signal has gone down. Okay, that's why. Um, okay. Yeah. Or also you may inhibit. This is a normal rate for this muscle yeah. contract. Yeah. And if you go with a different rate, yep. some are going to stimulate, some are going to inhibit. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we did here. This could be species dependent, right? We don't, we haven't tested this in humans yet. But here we just said, all right, what if I change the frequency at an individual location of the massage? And what we found was a little bit slower massage works better. It, it, by better meaning we get really good pumping of the of the dye. And if you go too fast, you don't get as good. Maybe the relaxation time for the vessel to fill and then eject is just not enough. I mean, so you don't get as much pumping. Right. Then we did another thing is we well we have a bunch of cuffs in a row. So the question is, well. When I squeeze this one, how quickly after I squeeze this one should I squeeze this one and then this one? So the speed right. at which that travels, this is the velocity of that traveling wave. And here it wasn't, you know, slower is better. It seemed to be there was an optimal. So if you if you move too fast, it doesn't work as well. Or if you move too slow, it doesn't work as well. But there seems to be kind of an ideal speed. Again, this we think this would probably depend upon the size and the geometry and the species of what you're and testing. the location, the tail the location, the and the location, and pathology but and there is this ideal preferred, yep. um, you know, sort of propagation of massage. Uh, and so we have, I don't know if I have the slide for this. Oh, and then, and then the other thing is we did an injury model and we showed that the sensitivity massage changes after injury. And this is, of course, early stage. This is only a month after injury, but the vessel is really sensitive to massage a month after injury. Um, we took a nanoparticle technology, little, you can think of them as like little spheres that can hold drug. They're about 50 nanometers in size and diameter. We can load these with a drug that activates calcium channels. Calcium channels are on lymphatic muscle and they actually trigger contraction. And so you could think of it as a way to activate pacemaking, if you will, in lymphatics. And the nanoparticle gets the drug just to the lymphatic vessel. So you inject it just like you would inject ICG or, you know, these lymphatic imaging tracers, you inject the drug, it drains to lymphatics, and then the drug is released right there and gets them to pump. And so what you're seeing there is a, the top video is a nanoparticle that has nothing in it. And the bottom is a nanoparticle with drug, and we could get the lymphatics to pump more strongly. For how long? When you um, yeah, great, great question. So in this first iteration of the technology, the effect would last uh, for up to eight hours uh, after a single injection. And we went on to show, so in this paper here in an animal model, we did daily injections, but we did them in a very specific fashion. So these were mice that were at risk of getting lymphatic disease. And we did daily injections for a set period of time. I think it was two weeks total. And we could actually prevent the failure of the lymphatic pump. And so we, in this model, the, over time, the lymphatic loses its pressure generation capacity and goes away. And so with these daily injections, we could prevent the failure of the lymphatic pump. So this is pressure right here. And so this is like the pressure. These things can still generate pressure when, when they've been treated. But if they aren't treated, these are just different control groups. But if they aren't treated, they lose a lot of their ability to generate pressure. On the yeah. lymphedema model of uh, your... Yes. Did you... Yeah, so... We just got funding from NIH to do um, s more studies on the larger animal models. And on we have a better model now of persistent lymphedema that involves radiation. And so we haven't done those studies yet. These were done in the mouse model. And one, one caveat to the mouse model is that um, it will the swelling will resolve itself if you kind of wait long enough, even if the pumping actually doesn't return. The other thing that we're excited about you know, we think when you start thinking about going into human patients, daily injections is really not ideal. We have a formulation now, and we have data that suggests that we think we can we can get that effect to last up to a week, actually. Do you have any other effect by increasing lymphatic contractility on aging, on skin, on... Yeah, the only thing we've tested is, is what's in D there. And that's actually, we looked at collagen in the skin. 
And in lymphedema, typically you have fibrosis and accumulation of collagen. And this is a comparison with the drug if you just give the drug on its own versus if you give the drug in a nanoparticle. So that's the difference between black and purple. And if you if you give the drug by itself, it doesn't help. You still get lymphedema, fibrosis, and collagen accumulation. And, and we showed why. The reason if you give the drug by itself, it's really small and it, it drains into the blood vasculature and immediately gets cleared. Uh, it shows up within the blood in one minute after injection. But because we have it in the nanoparticle, it keeps it from going into the blood makes it go only towards the lymphatics. And when you do that and you get the lymphatics to pump, uh, you end up with less fibrosis in the skin and collagen. To my knowledge, the first technology, even in an animal, that's been able, like a drug approach, that's been able to directly enhance lymphatic pumping. So yeah. you activate the lymphatic vessel locally, not yes. the body, right? You do. Exactly. This is correct. So we have other data that shows other lymphatic vessels are not altered with this. It's only the, the lymphatic vessels that drain that are altered. Not just one lymph vessel, right? One region of vessels. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you can think, like, you probably familiar with this idea of like drainage basins. So yeah. basically, it's the basin that's draining that injection site that's going to have access to the drug. This is, it, it's called a hydrogel. It's, um, we call it hydrogel because it's mostly water. So you could think of it as a structure, a support system that allows lymphatics to grow onto it. We have a hydrogel that's really good at growing lymphatics, specifically even lymphatic endothelial cells and lymphatic muscle cells. We think that this could provide a platform for, for lymphatic vessel transplant, but also maybe even lymph node transplant. This is showing the idea of the lymph node transplant. This is a measurement of fluid transport, and this is our lymph node when we have a hydrogel present. Brandon, thank you so much for your time. It was so interesting to see you. I hope sure. we'll talk later.